This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory of Mrs. Marilyn Schlossberg, Mirka Bas Moshe Shmuel. May her soul be elevated in heaven. Our Parsha, Parsha's Vayishlach, is action packed. It begins with Jacob sending scouts out to his brother Asaph. He discovers that Asaph is coming towards him with violent intentions, with 400 heavily armed men. Jacob responds by sending Esav a lavish tribute. And then Jacob, before he meets Esav, is stranded and has a nocturnal struggle with the angel of Esav. He is renamed by the angel Israel. And then he finally encounters Esav and he bows him several times. And he navigates that whole encounter quite skillfully. After he frees himself from Esav, he buys a parcel of land outside the city of Shechem for 100 kashita. Dina, his daughter, is kidnapped and raped by Shechem. Then Shechem wants to marry Dina, and there is the ruse of the sons of Jacob. They say, okay, fine, we'll intermarry with you, and we'll be one society, but you have to circumcise. They agree, and when they are weak and vulnerable, Shimon and Levi come and slaughter the entire city, all the male inhabitants of the city. Jacob travels away and thanks the Almighty for not being pursued. We have the death of Devorah and God renames Jacob Israel. Benjamin is born and Rachel dies in childbirth. Reuben interferes with his father's conjugal life. The Parsha enumerates the 12 sons of Jacob. And finally, towards the end of the Parsha, Jacob is reunited with his father Isaac. And then Isaac dies at the age of 180, and he's buried by Jacob and Esau in the cave of the patriarchs. Now, actually, that happened much later. The Torah, of course, we know is not necessarily in chronological order, but it's in topical order. And therefore, when it's finished talking about Isaac, it wraps up his story and tells us of his passing. So that's the Parsha, kind of roughly the high points of the Parsha. Lots of action. Jacob has to meet and navigate the very perilous encounter with his brother, does it successfully, and then he has to run into the other buzzsaw of Dina being kidnapped, etc. And then, ostensibly, you would think the Parsha ends. If you were to ask people what comes next, what's the final part of our Parsha, I think most people, maybe not, of course, the Parsha podcast family. But most people would struggle to say what else happens in our Parsha. There are 43 verses at the end of our Parsha that are all detailing the family of Esav. It's running through all his wives and all the mistresses and all the sons and all the chieftains and all the bastards. You need to be like a gifted genealogist to map out this very complicated family tree. But this is the last that we hear of Esav. The rest of the Torah focuses solely on the family of Jacob, on the Jewish people. Now, Rashi, in the beginning of next week's Parsha, he gives us an analogy. He says that the Torah runs through the settlement and the chronicles and the children of Esav really quickly because they weren't really so dignified or important. And we don't know exactly, you know, how did they settle and what all their wars are about and how do they conquer the land. But it kind of runs through that story really fast. And then when it wants to talk about the family of Jacob, it slows down. And it gives us every beat of the story and all the cause and effect and things that happened. Why? To show you that they are cherished and they are important in the eyes of God and therefore the Torah elaborates on their story. Similarly, tells us Rashi, you have the 10 generations from Adam to Noah. It runs through, he had him and he had him and he begot him, etc. until it gets to Noah and then it slows down and it tells us Noah's story in detail. And then the other part is Noah, it does the same thing from Noah to Abraham. It runs through 10 generations. He begot he, he begot he, he begot etc. until it gets to Abraham and then slows down. And then Rashi furnishes an analogy you have a gem, a diamond that gets trapped in a bunch of sand. So you take a sieve and you sift through the sand until you find a diamond. But once you find a diamond, you discard the pebbles and you focus on 
the diamond. So at the end of our Parsha, after all the action of our Parsha, it dedicates 43 verses to delineating the generations of Esav. And that is what we are going to discuss in this week's edition of the Parsha podcast from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. The email address is RabbiWalby at gmail.com. Now, I want to give you a little bit of the backstory of this podcast. When I work on a, on a Parsha podcast, I'm so fortunate I get to work on a Parsha podcast. But how do I do it? How do I prepare? So I work with Google Docs. I know that some people have very strong opinions about Microsoft Word or Google Docs. I use Google Docs and I have comprehensive notes. And every year, I have a new document for that week's or that week's every year's week. I have a document for that week's Parsha podcast. And whatever's left over, whatever doesn't make the final cut, doesn't end up in the podcast, I roll it over for next year. So this year, the Jewish calendar year is the year 5782. So the document that I'm working off right now is called Vayishlach, the name of our Parsha, 5782. If you wanted to find, if I wanted to find my document from last year's podcast on Parsha's Vayishlach, I would look for Vayishlach 5781. Now, I also have next year's Parsha's Vayishlach podcast, or at least the document that I'm adding all my notes to Parsha's Yishlach for next year. It's called Vayishlach 5783. So whatever doesn't make it this year into the podcast, I'm going to roll it over into the notes for next year's podcast. Of course, please God, with the help of the Almighty, we can't be sure that we're going to last even another day, another minute here. Every breath that we have is a gift from the Almighty. But we're hoping that the Almighty gives us long life and the ability to teach Torah and to spread Torah and to run the Parsha podcast and all the other amazing podcasts for a long time. But it's a nice system that I work with over here because if I ever encounter anything that I really like, any idea on any Parsha, what I do is I find the document that contains the upcoming year's notes for that parsha and i could just add it there and that way once we get to the parsha itself i can see okay what what do i have what do i have in previous years what did i amass what notes did i amass on this parsha in the year since we last visited this subject now why am i telling you all of this because whenever i start studying the parsha beginning of the week i open up that year's document and that includes all the thoughts that i had in the parsha either last year or over the course of the year that were not included in the previous episode. And I open up, and it says in bold letters, amazing insight should be in the podcast. Meaning that whenever I wrote these notes, I decided that this is something that should really be in the next Parsha podcast on Parsha's Vayishlach. So that got my attention. And when I read my notes, I'm like, yes. I wholeheartedly agree. This should be the Parsha podcast. Now, when you finish listening to this, you tell me if you agreed as well. The image says, RabbiWolbyChim.com. And that's the plan. What do you say? Shall we begin? From the tour center in lovely Houston, Texas. Let's begin. When we study the story of Asav and his family, Chapter 36, the 43 verses of chapter 36 in Genesis, we find something very perplexing. It starts off by telling us, these are the children, the descendants of Esav. Esav is Edom. What does it mean that Esav is Edom? So the word Edom or Adom is the Hebrew word for red. Esav was red. He was a redhead. He was ruddy. In fact, when he was born, by Yezer Shon Admoni, he was red. But that's not the reason why he's called Edom. Why was Esav called Edom? So there is an explicit verse in Parshas Toldos, chapter 25, verse 31. This is talking about after Jacob is making a stew, and Esav comes and is really hungry, and he tells Jacob, Halitainina, give me to eat from this red, red thing, because I'm very tired, I'm exhausted. Concludes the verse, again, chapter 25, verse 31. 
Al Kane Kara Shmo Edom. This is why he is called Edom. This is a fitting name for Esav or a nickname for Esav. He's called Edom because Edom means red. And when he wanted the stew, he wanted the red, red stew with the red, red stuff. And therefore, that is his nickname going forward. And now, many years later, at that juncture, Esav was a teenager. Esav and Jacob were teenagers. Now, Jacob already has a family. We're talking about his kids, his grandkids, great-grandkids, all the chieftains and teens that came from him. He's still being called Edom. Why is this a fitting nickname? So the Ramban tells us that the soup that Esav coveted was a red soup. It was a red lentil soup. Why was it red? So the Ravan says it was either red because of the lentils, or maybe it was spiced with red spices, and that's why it was red. When Asaf saw the stew, he didn't know what it was. It wasn't like it was like meatballs. You kind of know what meatballs are, or I don't know, pizza, or tomato sauce. It was something foreign to Asaf. He didn't know what it was. So he really wanted it, and he coveted it, but he didn't know how to identify it. So he says, let me identify it by what I do know. I do know that it's red. And therefore he told Jacob, give me from the red, red stuff. Says the Ramban, the fact that he is called Edom, based upon this story, it is a name of ridicule and derision. He is being lambasted and derided by the Torah because he sold the distinguished birthright for a small dish. And he quotes a verse in Proverbs. The verse says, Ki zolel vesove ye varesh. Someone who is very gluttonous becomes poor. Esav was a glutton. He was a lustful person. And it is a great embarrassment to him that he became spiritually impoverished because of something so small, this small red dish, and therefore the Torah has this nickname for him. What the Rabban is telling us here, and this is something which is echoed by many of the other commentators, Esau was called Edom because this episode revealed his shortcomings. He was someone who really liked food. He was a glutton. He was also superficial. He didn't even investigate what the dish was. Give me the red, red, red thing. He was small-minded. He was short-sighted. He was so foolish to exchange his birthright for a dish that he didn't even know what it was. It wasn't like he had a weakness for it. You know, if you have an addict, someone, God forbid, is addicted to meth or heroin, They would trade even their own children to be able to get a hit. Esav was not addicted to this red stuff. He just was short-sighted, small-minded. He didn't know what it was. But nevertheless, he was willing to part with the birthright to get it. And that's all the way back in Parshish Toldos when Jacob and Esav were teenagers. That's when he was christened Edom. And now it's much later. And the Torah is enumerating his vast family and vast dynasty that he fathered. And it begins, 36.1, introduces him as Edom. This is the same small person who was originally called Edom. Now here's where it gets interesting. When you read this chapter, you see how Esau develops. So in verses 2 through 5, He gets married, he marries three different women, and he bore a bunch of children in Canaan. And then in verse 6, he gathers his possessions and his family, and he moves because of Jacob. And in verse 8, he settles in Mount Seir, and then we read something astonishing. Vayesh of Esav Bahar Seir, Esav dwelled in Mount Seir, Esav who Edom, Esav is Edom. In verse 1, we were told that Esav is Edom. And now in verse 8, it's only been seven verses later, we're again told the information we already know. But it doesn't stop there. 
the very next verse, verse 9, it introduces the expanded genealogy of Esav. Ve'ela told us Esav, avi Adom. These are the children of Esav, the father of Adom. And it talks about his sons and grandsons and even great-grandsons from each of his wives and the tribes that they formed and the dynasties that they spawned. We, For example, we meet Amalek for the first time. He's the son of Eliphaz, which is Esav's son. And Eliphaz has a mistress, and they produce Amalek. And then it recaps the chieftains and the family heads. And then we read in verse 19, Ela, Bene Esav, these are the sons of Esav, Ve'ela, the famous, these are the leaders. Who Edom? He is Edom. For the fourth time in 19 verses, Esav is identified as Edom. But this is not over quite yet. The verse continues detailing the various generations of Esav. For example, we meet the inglorious Tzivon, who sleeps with his mother and produces a bastard named Anna. He sounds like a real gentleman. And this bastard was the one who brought more bastardization to the world. He, we're told, is the first one to breed a male horse with a female donkey, producing a mule. And then it transitions to the kings of Edom, verse 31. These are the kings who ruled the land of Edom. And it delineates eight kings of Edom from Esav's descendants. We talk about kings and princes and chieftains, rulers, powerful men. And then the final verse of our parsha, Aluf Magdiel, the leader or the chieftain of Magdiel, Rashi actually tells us that's Rome. Aluf Iram, Elu Alufe Edom. These are the chieftains of Edom. Lemosh Vasam, Be'eretz Achuzasam, Hu Esav, Avi Edom. The last words of our parsha recaps. This is Esav, the father of Edom. For the fifth time, Esav is identified as Edom. Five times over the course of the enumeration of the vast dynasty of Esav, we are reminded who Esav is, how he behaved like a immature, impetuous, short-sighted child. Five times we're told, Esav is Edom, again and again. Now, the obvious question is, the Torah doesn't have any extra words. Why is it repeating the same thing over and over again? Verse 1, verse 8, verse 9, verse 19, verse 43. And a bunch of other times it mentions Edom as a kingdom that Esav fathered. So Edom is like a repeated refrain in this whole chapter. Why is the Torah repeating information that we already know? I think there's a very deep insight over here. Why was Esav called Edom? Because he sold his birthright for a bowl of red soup. The word Edom indicates how small Esav was, how immature, how underdeveloped, how short-sighted and superficial he was. Now, you have to remember, this is something we've talked about in the past. Esav had the potential to become something really special. His head, of course, is buried in the cave of Machpelah, meaning that he had the ability to become the fourth patriarch. He was supposed to marry one of the sisters, either Rachel or Leah, and he was supposed to be the fourth patriarch. Instead, what actually happened is that Jacob became the third and the fourth patriarch. He married both sisters. He had both his Jacob identity and his Israel identity. Jacob is someone who wore Esau's clothing. He commandeered Esau's role. But Esav remained Edom. Instead of Esav fulfilling his potential, he remained small. And the Torah reiterates again and again, he is Edom, he is Edom, he is Edom. Notwithstanding everything that happened to him, he remained small. While detailing the amazing accomplishments of Esav, it didn't change him. Esav is Edom. No matter how advanced he got, the core characteristic that was at play when he said, give me the red, red, red stuff, and that's when he gets named Edom, that quality, that characteristic was still at play 
when he fathered chieftains, when he fathered kings, when he got married, when he moved, he is Edom. Asaph got married. Marriage is an opportunity to reinvent yourself, to start from scratch, to turn over a new leaf. And that's how the chapter begins. He gets married, but he remains at home. The same foolish boy who was mesmerized by the red, red, red soup, he's still the same guy. It's interesting, our sages tell us that someone who gets married has all their sins forgiven. What's the source of this idea? What is the origin of this idea that someone gets married has all their sins expunged? The source is that Esav married a woman named Machlas. The word Machlas, the word Machal, means forgiveness. Esav is the poster boy of this idea that marriage is a brand new, fresh start. You can walk away from your previous pettiness. With his marriage, Esav had a golden opportunity to become big. To walk away from being small, immature, short-sighted. But he didn't. Esav is Edom. And then he had children. He became a father. He became responsible for other people. Nothing makes a man assume adulthood than being responsible for another human. Becoming a parent. Esav became a parent. He was a father, yet he was Edom. He did not change. He moved. He left Canaan. He moved to Seir. Moving, relocation is another opportunity for self-reinvention. Asaph was given another chance, but he stayed small. He remained Edom. The Talmud tells us the book of Rosh Hashanah, page 16b, there are four themes that tear apart a person's negative decree. If you have a decree against you from God, there are four things you could do to uproot that, to tear that away, tear that apart. Number one, tzedakah, charity. Number two, tzedakah, which means to cry out to God. Number three, shinoi Hashem, changing your name. Number four, changing your deeds. V'yesh omrim, Continues the Talmud, and there are those who say, Af shinui makom. If you don't give charity, and you don't cry out to God, and you don't change your identity, you don't change your name, and you don't change your behavior, you just move. You relocate to a new place, you're now a new person. And the decree that was levied against your previous self is not relevant and current anymore. There's a famous aphorism. Mishanem akom, mishanem azal. If you change your place, you change your luck, your karma. If you've ever moved to a new city or to a new town or to a new environment, you know what this is like. You have a chance to change how you present yourself. Asaph had this chance. Yet despite moving, he remained at home. He had children and then he had grandchildren. He became a grandfather, and then he became a great-grandfather. And he remained at Dome. He fathered kings and chieftains and warriors and leaders. But fundamentally, he remained with the exact same flaws as before. Esav is at Dome. He was refusing to change, refusing to pivot, refusing to actually fundamentally assess who he is what you're living for, what you're here for, what can I improve, how can I change? No, the same priorities, the same ideals, the same qualities, the same flaws and shortcomings that he had as a teenager, he maintained. Notwithstanding all those tremendous upheavals and changes that he had in his life. I think there's a fantastic insight over here. When you start off your life, you develop certain habits. You develop a self-identity. You get into a groove. And you become comfortable with who you are. And this is all of us. And we begin to feel that certain things are, you know, that's just not for me. 
you know, there's a statement that irritates me almost more than anything else. Oh, I, I can't do that. Oh, I'm not good at that. Oh, I don't do that. You know, the example I think of is someone's like, uh, why don't you, why don't you speak? Why don't you be the chazan, lead the services? Oh, that's not me. Oh, I can't do that. What it probably means is, I tried it when I was a teenager and I struggled. I wasn't perfect on day one. So I decided I'm just not good at it. I remember when I, when I came to Houston, we moved to Houston to join the team at Torch. I started giving classes and Torah topics. And this eventually, of course, morphed into the various podcasts, but I gave classes to live audiences. And actually, if you go back to the archive, not on the Parsha podcast as much, but in the This Jewish Life podcast channel, you can listen to the old catalog. It's pretty gnarly stuff. The audio is really not good. I would just use my phone to record. But even the quality and the presentation, not as polished as it is today. Was I good at it or was I bad at it? I think objectively, I was pretty mediocre. But if you do it a thousand times, you'd get better. Is that a shock? I did actually have a friend of mine and a studious podcast listener tell me that actually my best voice was in 2019. And now at the end of 2021, I guess I'm past my prime. I'm turning 35 in December. I can always say, you know what? We had a good run over a thousand episodes. Not bad. We'll take it. I did tell my wife, actually, that, wow, turning 35 means I'm halfway to 70. But I told her, I said, I'm actually looking forward to it. Please, God, all the kids will be on their own, married with their own families. And I could just record podcasts in total silence. It sounds like a dream. And yeah, of course, I'm, I'm just babbling here, so ignore that. But I remember when I started doing this, I was so nervous I was so wound up speaking publicly. Again, mind you, this is to small audiences, 15 people, 20 people. It's not like I'm speaking in front of a thousand people. But I was so nervous, I got these like searing pains in my legs and thighs when I would speak. Now, maybe if I wasn't hired to do this, I would say, you know what? I'm just not good at this. And I would just go sell cabinets, I don't know, or real estate or open up a bakery. I don't know what. Perhaps I could have said, I'm just not good at it. And the truth is, you know what? And the truth is, I wasn't good at it. But here's the insight. Humans are capable of change, of transformation, of development. And I know this sounds cliche. It sounds platitudinal. But the truth is, most people don't believe it. So I'll say it again. Humans are capable of change. It is the hardest thing in the world, but it's very doable. And I think Asaph's story tells us that life throws us all kinds of opportunities to make change easier. You can, of course, change even if no circumstances around you change. But that's much harder. It's much easier when you have some sort of impetus that's impelling you, that's nudging you to change. You get married. The Talmud says all your sins are forgiven. Why? Because this is such an upheaval in your life, there's an assumption that you will change. And now, therefore, you know, as a result of that, you're a new person. And you know what? The court, the heavenly court, they're just not going to reckon with your previous self. Who cares? You're a new person. And even Asim had his sins forgiven. In fact, he's the one who we learned this law from. He married Machlas and he had all his sins forgiven. But Asim is someone who remained Edom. He failed to utilize that opportunity to change. Now, I noticed something really interesting in our Parsha. I mentioned this on the rebroadcast. When Jacob finally meets his brother, 
It says he comes with his four wives and 11 children. So Rashi asks the question, what about Dina? What about his 12th child, his daughter, Dina? So Rashi says that Jacob hid his daughter Dina. Why? Because she was very pretty. And he did not want Esav to covet her. And therefore he hid her in a box. And then Rashi concludes, and that is why Jacob was punished because he withheld her from his brother. She could have influenced him to change. And as a result of that, he withheld her from his brother. She ended up in a much worse place in the hands of Shem. I think there's an interesting insight over here. You know, usually... The younger you are, the more fluid, the more malleable you are. But the more entrenched you get in your ways, the harder it is to change, the harder it is to pivot. But now, if you do the calculation, how old is Esav at the time? How old is Esav and Jacob when they reunite? Well, they were 63 at the time of the blessing heist. Jacob spent 14 years studying in the Academy of Shem and Aver. That would make both of them 77. He spent 20 years with Laban. So when they are reuniting, I think the math is correct. Jacob is 97 and his twin brother Esau is also 97. Yet we're told that had he married Dina in that counterfactual world, Dina may have changed him. Marriage is such a powerful rejiggering of someone's life it's an opportunity to change. Now, what's interesting about this, this year I had a, a new wrinkle in this idea. Dina, in our parsha, indeed got a brutish monster to agree to circumcise. She was taken by Shem, and Shem agreed to change himself and to change his life for Dina. So we see that she did have the ability to get a very sinful man to repent. And maybe she could have done that for Esav as well. Now, of course, in the rebroadcast, we asked the question, how could Jacob be punished when he did the responsible thing of hiding his daughter from his brother? But the insight I want to pull out of this, Esav is 97 years old. He has been a sinner for more than 80 years. But even him, even so late in the game, the new situation is so powerful, it could potentially nudge him to change. Every change in our situation affords us a golden opportunity to change who we are and how we view ourselves. Esav was, as the title of the podcast suggests, he just wasn't ready to change. The red, ruddy, redhead who was enamored by the red stew was unwilling to change from being Adam. If you are lucky enough to move, to get a new job, to get move to a different city, to become a parent, to become a grandparent, to become a great-grandparent. At every juncture of your life, you've been given a new opportunity to change. You don't need to remain the same small person that you were previously. We are all given multiple opportunities to reinvent ourselves. There are innumerable such opportunities for us to change, and we must seize them. But Esav was Adom, from start to finish. No matter what happened to him, he refused to change. I was thinking this is actually a theme in Esav's life. When he was one-upped by Jacob, Jacob impersonates him, steals his blessings, and then Esav comes before Isaac, and he freaks out, and Isaac confirms the blessings. He says, I'm endorsing them, Jacob should remain blessed. This was another opportunity for him to admit his blunder. But he couldn't do it. And he plots to murder Jacob. And he harbored the enmity for 34 years. Could you imagine holding a grudge for that long? He didn't change. When you don't change, you remain small forever. I think there's a great lesson over here. 
you know, we're talking about life changes. You have a new milestone in your life. It's an opportunity to change. And at every juncture of Asaph's life, every time he had a new opportunity to change, the Torah tells us the story. It says he's Adam. He's Adam. He's Adam. He didn't change. Marriage didn't do it for him. Becoming a parent didn't do it for him. Moving didn't do it for him. Becoming a grandparent even. Great-grandparent. Becoming a father of kings and chieftains and all that. Didn't do it for him. He remained Edom, he was resistant to change. But I think it's not only the milestones of our lives that give us these opportunities. Truthfully, I think maybe this is why we sleep every night. Every single day is a new chance to change. Every Shabbos, every week is a total reset. Start from scratch. In fact, if you look at the prayer that we say, after Shabbos, in the mire of prayer after Shabbos, there's a special insert that we insert, which includes the following words. Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our master, the wheat that we are about to embark upon, make it peaceful and free of any sin and cleansed of any iniquity. Every week, we start off the week and it's a clean slate. And we remind ourselves that no matter what happened last week, we can go an entire week without any mistakes. It's possible. It's a new start. The opportunities are endless. Every day is a blank canvas. Every week is an opportunity. Every month, we start from scratch, start from a clean, new approach, new attitude, a new start. Of course, every year, Rosh Hashanah, a new person, every life milestone, all these are chances to reinvent ourselves. But Esav remained at home. But we don't need to follow Esav. He's not our forefather. We can follow Jacob. We don't need to remain the same small child that we were as youngsters or as teenagers. Okay, let's get to this week's exquisite insight. It's actually coming a little bit more natural. It's just an insight. I like it. In our parsha, again, there's so much happening in our parsha. But Reuben, Reuven, the oldest son of Jacob, he interferes with Jacob's conjugal life. This is chapter 35, verse 22. The verse says, if you just read the verse without looking at the commentators, it says that Reuben, Reuven, slept with Bilhah, which is one of his father's wives. But the verse concludes, the sons of Jacob were 12. So Rashi tells us what actually happened. He disrupted the sleeping arrangements of Jacob. Why? Because after Rachel died, Rachel died in childbirth, when Benjamin was born, after Rachel died, Jacob had a primary bed that he always kept in the tent of Rachel. And then when she died, he uprooted his bed from the tent of Rachel and he placed it not in the tent of Leah, his more primary remaining wife, but in the tent of Bilhah, who was Rachel's maidservant. Now, Ruvain, he's the son of Leah and he was miffed. He was upset by this. So he took... Jacob's primary bed, dragged it out of Billah's tent and placed it in his mother Leah's tent. He thought it was embarrassing. It was an insult to his mother and he wanted to rectify it. But the Torah is very severe, very strict in how it treats the righteous. And therefore a small misty that somehow involved his interference in his father's conjugal life, that is so severe for someone as righteous as Reuben, that the Torah considers it as if he actually violated, so to speak, in a terrible way, the sanctity of Jacob's marital life. But the verse immediately follows by saying that Jacob had 12 sons, not to get under the impression that one of them was different than the rest. They were all righteous. Don't be under the mistaken impression that Reuben actually did something so severe. And the Talmud, by the way, says unequivocally, Call Haomer Reuven Chata, whoever says that Reuven actually did a terrible sin of adultery, Eino Elato, you're just mistaken. 
I mean, of course, Ruben did a bit blunder, but it's not a, a blunder which is as severe as it is plainly portrayed in the verse. But the fact is that when Jacob is on his deathbed, at the end of Genesis, he tells Ruvain that because you were so impetuous, you were running like water, in rearranging the beds, you are going to lose the monarchy to Judah and the priesthood to Levi and the firstborn right to Joseph. Joseph is going to have a double portion in tribes, but not you. So Ruvain, in fact, was punished for his interference in Jacob's conjugal life. So I want to tell you, the exquisite insight is courtesy of the Arachim. The Arachim is found in chapter 49 of Genesis, at the episode of Jacob's deathbed blessings to his sons. And what he says is either going to be super obvious to you, or it will totally blow your mind. There is a principle that the thoughts and intentions of a couple at the time of conception, that will determine the quality of the soul that they summon. So if you have a really righteous couple and they're thinking very pure thoughts, then they are able to summon a very lofty soul to be inserted in the child, or what's going to emerge into the zygote, I think is the technical term, into the zygote that will become the fetus, the embryo, eventually the child, the child will be born with a lofty soul. But if they are thinking not good thoughts, so the example, Tommy gives a bunch of examples, but one of the examples is, if the man is thinking about a different woman, he's with his spouse, and he's thinking about a different woman, then that is going to summon a more compromised soul to be inserted into that child. Why was Reuben specifically the one, out of all the brothers, with this particular shortcoming that he tampered with Jacob's bed? So the Archaim points at something really interesting. What happened the night that Reuben was conceived? Reuben, Jacob tells us, again, this is in chapter 49 of Genesis, Reuben was conceived on Jacob's wedding night. But what happened by Jacob's wedding night? He was under the impression that he was being given Rachel. In truth, it was Leah. When did Jacob discover that? Jacob discovered that in the morning. At night, when Reuben was conceived, Jacob was under the mistaken impression that he was with a different woman, namely Rachel and not Leah. As a result of that, there became some sort of imperfection, so to speak, or flaw or shortcoming in the soul of Reuben. And therefore, the only way that there could be this impurity that's manifested in some in some way much later on, it was only because of this flaw at the time of conception. And again, he concludes by quoting the Talmud, Book of Shabbos, page 55b. Don't say that Reuven actually sinned, because if you do that, you're making a mistake. But nevertheless, there was some sort of flaw here. The way it's portrayed is very negatively. And the origin story of it goes all the way back to the night of Reuven's conception and the mistake or the misunderstanding that was happening at the time. What an interesting idea. This general idea that the thoughts and the intentions of the couple is going to determine the degree of soul, so to speak, or the imperfections of soul that are to be featured in the child. And how interesting or exquisite this insight is of the Arachayim to tell us that that is actually manifested in Ruvain's life due to what happened on the night that he was conceived. Exquisite insight. I hope you enjoyed. I thank you for listening. Have an amazing, fabulous, splendid, wonderful, terrific rest of your day. An incredible and wonderful and delightful and peaceful and serene and uplifting and meaningful Shabbos upcoming. 
And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we'll talk again next week. The email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.